So Father, right now I pray that we reverently and clearly place ourselves before the throne of grace again, seeing the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Just think, loved ones, just think. Every sin we've ever committed, past, present, the sins of today and the sins of tomorrow, every single sin, all our greed, all our idolatry, all our hatred, all our gossip, all our lack of love, all our lies, all our unkindness, all the sin we've ever committed has been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith in Him. This is the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Every sin ever, this is why He died. That we sit here today, stand here today, kneel here today, saying, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. All our sins, all my sins, all the wickedness, all the evil of my heart, all the destruction from my life, has been purified by the Lamb of God through faith in Him. Wondrous, awesome. How can it be? Amazing, how can it be that Thou, my God, has died for me? Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Would we be so humble and so grateful today again? Our hope is found in the blood of the Lamb that has washed us as white as snow. Oh Lord, may this theology, as beautiful as it is, be transferred into such a love and affection for you. Teach us today, Holy Spirit, we need you to teach us through a rich and powerful passage. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Please find a Bible and open it to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll be looking at the first 18 verses, Lord willing, today together. Hebrews chapter 10, again, starting in verse 1. Our sermon title today is this, Oh, the blood, oh, the blood, once and for all. We're looking today at the sacrifice that end all sacrifices. Oh, the blood, the once and for all sacrifice. Excited for God to teach us as we do that. Again, theology some of us have never maybe known before others to be reminded of and others further still just to be so blessed as God is working in our hearts as it relates to the blood of the Lamb of God. Before we get into God's Word, I want to introduce you to my grandpa. And my grandpa has been uh, passed away now for 15 years. This is uh, Grandpa Simons. And uh, he was W.R. Simons, William Rex Simons. He went by uh, Rex. Cool, eh? What's up, Rex? It's good. And um, now I got saved a year before my grandfather passed away. This is a picture of Grandpa Simons when he was probably 28 or 29 years old. He was a minister for 41 years in the Anglican Church um, all throughout Ontario, the Evangelical Anglican Church at that time. And he was a man who loved the Lord. He was faithful to the Word of God. He was a simple man. He was a loving man. Uh, He was a good man. Married for all those decades to Granny, Granny, and Grandpa. And I see this picture of him here. And again, just in and around his ordination, went to Wycliffe Bible College at University of Toronto. And I've been in ministry long enough, man. You make it 10 years, that's pretty good. 20 years, not bad at all. 30 years, enough respect, all right? 40 plus years in the ministry. I don't care, big church, small church. You just faithfully seek to serve the Lord, a minister of the gospel, and you get through it, and you finish the race, and you had that one wife that whole time, and you raised five kids, and there you were, faithful to the Lord. Props, Grandpa, <laughs> You know, like, like, bless you, man. I just, I mean, I have so much respect for that happening. You know, interestingly, too, um, the day that my grandfather passed away, I was in the hospital visiting him up in Alliston, Ontario, just south of Barrie, where he finished up his ministry there. And I just tell you this, a chance to get to know me a little bit, but also to encourage you the way that the Lord works as well. And I was, again, a year or so in the faith and agonizing over this change that had taken place in my life and what does that mean, ministry or not, and all this kind of stuff. And I went up, I was in the hospital room with my grandpa, And he was in a place where he wasn't conscious. His eyes were open. He was breathing that very, his last kind of few breaths. Just kind of like the impulse of the body, just trying to gasp for air. And he wasn't saying anything. His eyes were kind of glazed over. I'm sitting there looking at him. And I can take you to the room. I can see him right now. I know exactly what that looked like for me. And there he was. And I just was in that moment. And I felt the Lord, didn't say audibly, just so deeply impression upon my heart. The, The phrase was something like this. Or was this? It was, Robbie, Um, take the reins. 
Now, my grandfather had been in ministry again for 40 plus years. The generation after him, no one was in ministry within our family or extended family. And here I was trying to discern what God was going to do with my life. And I sat in that moment. And what I really found the interpretation from that, his understanding was, as, as Grandpa held the reins in ministry for these four decades, Robbie, he's about to leave. And it's time for you now to pick up the mantle and to grab the reins of what it means to follow the Lord in this way. 20 minutes later, I left the hospital. And 20 minutes later, the phone rang. My grandma answered. My grandfather passed away. And I sat there with my grandmother and consoled her in that moment, all those years of faithful marriage and ministry together. And grandpa now was home with the Lord. And I drove home later on that night of spending lots of time with my grandma. And I just, I just cried. I just cried in the faithfulness of God and the amazing what it means to serve him faithfully and to not be perfect, but to do it as best you can, the strength of God for the glory of God, to see how that adds up to a life. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's what you're trying to do now as we seek to honor the Lord. Now, I wanted to introduce you to grandpa today because I want you to see this as it relates to our series in the blood. This is a gift that I received from my parents as it was handed down when my grandfather passed away. And this was my grandfather's travel communion set. This is, um, this is, this is precious to me. So inside this travel communion set, um, it says here, Reverend W.R. Simons from Church of St. Peter in Hamilton. That's where he began. And it's dated um, August 1942. And so what my grandfather would do, he would travel around and he would minister to the shut-ins who were not able to attend church and receive the Lord's Supper. And, and this would be the container for the, the body of Christ and representing, of course, the bread and the, the bread representing the body. And then you have this little flask where the wine would go in. I mean, just look at how precious this stuff is. And the wine would be placed in here and he'd go. And then after he would that, he would pour that into the little uh, flask here or the, the cup and he would serve the people. <laughs> so beautiful, isn't it? And the body of Christ, or the, the blood of Christ given for you, shed for you. And then, and then the, little, the little, look at this. That's cute, eh? I mean, cute's probably the wrong word, but just, it's just so, it's so beautiful. And just to, to, to serve the shut and, and say the body of Christ, again, which is given for you. Now, this has been something that, that, that I have treasured in this way. And one of the main reasons, as we even within our series right now, is what does this represent? It represents the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It represents today we see the once and for all sacrifice. It represents the blood of the lamb. It represents our salvation. It symbolizes the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The extent of my grandfather going around and humbly ministering the ordinance of the Lord's Supper to the people who could not make it is a symbol of how important this was, that we are reminded as to the theology of the blood of Jesus Christ and just how beautiful it actually is. The death of death in the death of Christ. And that's where the author of Hebrews takes us today. Chapter 10 is helping us understand the once for all sacrifice that is found through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to unpack it. We're going to understand it. The question we're seeking to answer overall today is what's the deal with the once for all sacrifice? What's the deal? What's the deal with this? The author in Hebrews, the Holy Spirit, is going to help us greatly. Here's the deal pertaining to the once for all sacrifice. Number one is this. It's a big deal. It's a big deal because the once for all sacrifice, listen, listen, it substantiates the shadow. The once for all sacrifice substantiates the shadow. Some of you are like, what are you talking about substantiating the shadow? Let's find out and let's learn together. Hebrews 10 Verse 1, check it out, it says this. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Now, I want you to see the first term here, shadow, and notice this term is describing the law. The shadow is describing the law or the old covenant system. So this is a very helpful description here. The old covenant then, in terms of Hebrews 10 verse 1, was a shadow, the text says, of the good things to come. Now think with me about what a shadow is. A shadow is something insubstantial. A shadow is something passing. A shadow is the shape of the real thing, but a shadow lacks the substance. You can't touch a shadow. You can't grab on to a shadow. You can't see color in a shadow. And notice right in verse one, the contrast of shadow 
with true form. You see that there? The contrast in verse 1 of the shadow as it compares with the true form of the good things that were to come. So one represents an outline. The shadow represents an outline. The other one, the good things that are to come, is the real thing. Consider as with a shadow, we see an outline. You get a sense of the size and the shape of the object within that shadow. A shadow gives you an idea of what something looks like, but again, it's not real. The shadow you cannot touch, and within a shadow, there are infinite amount of details that are left out, failing to accurately describe the thing that it's actually representing. This, then, is the old covenant that the author wants us to see. It gives you an idea of the real thing, but it can never replace the real thing. So notice then again in verse 1, notice he says a shadow of the good things. The old covenant is a shadow, but notice halfway through verse 1, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Here is the limitation of the shadow. It can never. The shadow can never make perfect. How do we know? Because the sacrifices need to be keep repeating, indicating the insufficient nature found within the old covenant system. It was temporary. It could not atone fully for the sins here. Now the author explains now in verses 1 through 4 what the old covenant though is a shadow of. And this becomes really exciting, really beautiful. So we see three things in verses 1 through 4 that the Old Covenant is a shadow of. On the screen beside me here, notice this first of all. The Old Covenant is a shadow of perfection. So this is verse 1. The Old Covenant system could not, could never make perfect those under the Old Covenant format of sacrifices. Why? Why? Well, because the blood of a goat can only go so far. And again, that's why the sacrifices kept on being repeated because they were not finishing the job. So the old covenant system wasn't perfect, but the old covenant was a shadow of the perfection that was to come in the new covenant and the once for all sacrifice found in the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ. Secondly, the old covenant is a shadow of purification. This is verse two. Look at verse two. It says this, otherwise... Would they have not, if the sacrifices were legit and made people perfect, otherwise would they have not ceased to have been offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. The point here is this. If the old covenant system resulted in true purification, then the conscience would be clean. We would know we've been forgiven forever, and therefore the sacrifices would cease. But here again we learn the very fact that animal sacrifices were ongoing proved to the people that they were not ultimately freed from sin. They were not ultimately granted access in the presence of God forever. They were not ultimately pure before the Lord. But the old covenant becomes a shadow of the purification that would be found in the new covenant with the death of Christ ending death itself. A shadow of perfection, a shadow of purification, and the old covenant is this, it's a shadow of permanence. It's foreshadowing the permanent once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is verse 3, the limitations of the old covenant. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. Again, we learned this a couple of weeks ago. The very fact that the high priest had to keep going through the Day of Atonement was showing them and proving to the people just how limited it actually was. The author keeps making the same point. The Old Covenant was limited. It was temporary. It was imperfect. And verse 4 explains exactly why. Look at verse 4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It's impossible for the blood of an animal to take away sin. So you see then, the high priest who entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, once a year, he went in and he sprinkled the blood of a goat on top of the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. When he sprinkled the blood of the animal upon the mercy seat, it covered sin. Listen carefully. It did not put away sin. It covered sin. It did not take away sins, as it says in Hebrews 9. 
So the sprinkling of the blood of a goat on top of the mercy seat was ultimately a shadow of the once for all sacrifice that would come in Jesus Christ. But this is why these chapters and verses are so glorious and so magnificent. They are highlighting for us the massive deal, the huge deal, the great deal regarding the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus that fills in the shadow. It's the blood of Jesus that colors in the shadow. It's the blood of Jesus that substantiates the shadow. It's the blood of Jesus that moves from us looking at an outline to actually touching the real thing. Think of Thomas in his doubt and what he says to Jesus in John chapter 20. I won't believe unless I see and touch whatever. And Jesus says to him, notice this, Jesus says, put your finger here, Thomas, and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. What he's saying right there to Thomas, Thomas, I'm not a shadow. I am not a shadow. I am the real deal. I am the real thing. Touch me, Thomas. Go ahead and find out I'm not a ghost. I carry the blood of the Lamb of God, and I spilt it that the whole world will be forgiven. Thomas, I am not a shadow. Thomas, I am real. I have died, and I have been raised from the dead that I may pay for the sins of the world, the ones for all sacrifice. Jesus says to Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas, understand, you're not looking at a shadow, man. You're looking at the real deal. You're looking at the real thing. Don't not disbelieve, he says, but believe, but believe. Shadow, shadow, understand, Thomas, not a shadow. A big deal, a huge deal, a massive deal. The Lamb of God has died. The Lamb of God has shed his blood. The Lamb of God has dealt with sin. We're unpacking and understanding why the once and for all sacrifice was such a big deal. And secondly, we learn this. It was a big deal. Secondly, it was God's deal. God's deal. It's God's deal because it fulfilled God's will. The once for all sacrifice fulfilled the will of God. Look now at verse 5. Hey, Lovins, notice this. We're just going verse by verse. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, and now verse 5. Isn't this fun? It's so great. And the keen Bible students are like, yeah, I want to learn because you want to take the theology and transfer it to a love and affection for your God. Verse 5, the argument builds. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. This is Christ speaking. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now the quote here in Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 7, is taken from Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. Specifically, it's taken from the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the most common translation used in the first century. It's called the Septuagint. They just took the Hebrew and they translated it into Greek, which again was the most common language and the most common translation used in the first century. Notice here what Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8 becomes in light of the interpretation given by the Holy Spirit and the author of Hebrews found in chapter 10. Now this is a great tip right here when studying scripture. Here we see scripture being interpreted by scripture. When you're studying God's word, always use the cross references and your understanding of God's word to interpret scripture with scripture. And that's exactly again what the author of Hebrews is doing right now. He's taking Psalm 40 verses 6 to 8 and he's interpreting for us by the Holy Spirit as only he could in this sense. But here's what false teachers do. False teachers rip a verse out of context for their own self-gain, self-pleasure, whatever it is, their own wicked motives. They take a verse out of context. They fail to interpret it with the rest of Scripture. They hold it up. They form a doctrine of that Scripture unto its own, and they lead people astray for their motivations for evil devices and their own whatever it is. That's what false teaching almost always results from. A verse that has failed to be dealt with with effectiveness and with integrity within God's Word. But here within God's God's word, we see scripture being interpreted with scripture. And notice then what the statement from Psalm 40 verses 6 to 8 becomes in light of what we're learning. Psalm 40 verses 6 to 8, the author of Hebrews is telling us, is a prophetic statement of God's dissatisfaction with ritual sacrifice. God is saying here, I'm not okay with ritual sacrifice forever. 
God says, I want relationship. I'm not okay with its external temporary atonement. I want relationship and eternal and a once for all sacrifice. Notice what it also becomes because the author says in verse five, when Christ came in the world, he said, So he's saying now that Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8, is Jesus speaking. And what we learn there then is this becomes a prophecy of Christ's willingness to end the ritual in order to open up the relationship. Now that is awesome. God saying, I'm done with ritual, coming relationship. Jesus Christ himself saying, I've come to do your will, O God, where I myself will give of myself to do your will, to end ritual, and to open up the curtain that the presence of God might be freely offered to all those who receive the gift of grace by faith. In verse 5, it says, Sacrifices and offering you, God, you, you, God, you, God, have not desired. God would not settle for the old covenant. He brought a greater, a greater plan of sacrifice in the new, the once for all sacrifice of love. Notice this also in verse 5. This is a blessing. He says, but a body you have prepared for me. Think about that. Think about that. Stop, stop. Christ said, but a body, speaking to his Father, you have prepared for me. What body? A body you have prepared for me to accomplish your will. Loved ones, this is the wonder and the glory and the astonishment of the incarnation. And the incarnation is Christmas. Why do I love Christmas so much? This is why I love Christmas so much. Christmas is mind-blowing when you think about it. The eternal Son of God had a body prepared for Him by the eternal God the Father. And because He loved us so much, because His plan of salvation could only be accomplished through a perfect sacrifice, He prepared a body for His Son that would come in the form on the womb of Mary. And the child would be formed and be born in this humble state, in this humble place, in this lowly manger to an obscure couple to a town of nobodies and there would come the eternal son of God and a body prepared again by God for him that he might carry out God's will to die for you and me because he loved us so much that's why Christmas is astounding that's why Christmas is so awesome now listen 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 that's why the angel sang That's why the shepherds run. That's why John the Baptist leaps in the womb of Elizabeth when Mary walks into the same room. That's why the wise men bowed down and that's why Mary pondered these things with awe in her heart because all of them are saying, could it be true? Could it be true? It is true. It is true. A body has been prepared for God to take on that he might live and die and be raised from the dead. Now, if you know me at all, you know my favorite stories of Christmas is Simeon. And Simeon takes the child of God, and he knows, every time, man, he knows in the temple, he's got the child infant, he knows he's holding God. Boom, okay? He's holding God, and he knows it. And in the temple, I just never failed to Wow, wow, okay, listen, listen. He's holding God, and he says, he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. He knows, he knows he's holding the salvation of the world. And here's what he also knows. The child, the infant, the infant this, this, this little infant was formed in the womb of Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit. This little tiny child, he knows this child carries blood. And this child, his body has been filled with blood, but not just any blood. He carries perfect blood. There's blood flowing through the veins of this child and a blood that one day would be crucified on a cross and shed that anyone who believes in this child and what he has done and receives the washing of his blood, they will be forgiven forever for all sins, past, present, future. You tell me that's not glorious. That's what's happening, what Simeon sees. Your glory for your people, the light for the Gentiles, the blood of the lamb. He's holding the child that carries and is filled with the blood of the lamb. Look at verse 7 now. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Christ speaking, as it is written, me in the scroll of the book. I want you to see right here this incredible act of the incarnation, the crucifixion. Notice in verse 7, it's the will of God that Jesus be sacrificed. And it's the submission of Jesus that he was willing to do it. Jesus wasn't forced to the cross. He went willingly, voluntarily. It was his submission to the will of God. Look at the end of verse 7. As it is written of me in the scroll of the book, 
Now, loved ones, look right here. The whole Old Testament ultimately points to Jesus Christ. And the whole New Testament is also pointing to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the center of the world, the center of the universe. He is everything. And the whole Bible, the Bible is one story. The moment sin enters into the world through Adam and Eve, God sets in for and plan his rescue mission to bring his people back to himself. So Genesis 3, sin starts, and immediately God sets his plan in motion. And who does he use? He uses Abraham, and he uses Isaac, and he uses Jacob, and he uses Joseph, and he uses Samuel, and he uses David, and he uses Isaiah, and he uses Micah, and he goes on and on and all to the point where Jesus Christ will come. That is all because God has set his rescue plan in motion where the whole Bible points to Jesus. The death of Christ, loved ones, was ultimately the will of God. Why, why, why? Because he loves you and I so much that is why i have come to do your will O oh god verse 8 when he said above you had neither desire nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings. now this is this is exciting because the author now is providing his own holy spirit commentary on verses 5 to 7 and he goes through all the offerings according to the law verse 8 then he added behold i have come to do your will and notice he's telling us he abolishes the first covenant in order to establish the second or the new covenant there. So the author here is commentating on these things and he's telling us what we know because he's already told us in chapters 9 and 10 thus far. Now look at verse 10. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all here. Notice in this verse, verse 10, notice, God's will is the offering of Jesus' body, which would be once for all, meaning the sacrifice would never happen again. And notice the result of God's will, Christ's offering once for all sacrifice. Notice that we might be sanctified, meaning set apart for God. Jesus was offered that you and I, by grace, through faith, would be set apart from sin, that we would be free from the guilt of sin because it's been paid and washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the glory of our salvation, loved ones. This season, this time, this series, we were able to hold up the jewel of salvation and to look at it and say, oh man, I've never seen it that in that light before. It's awesome. And turn around and look from this angle and say, oh, that's beautiful too. The blood and the theology and then turn around one more time and just go, oh wow, the deal of God and fulfilling his will and Christ and what he's doing in my life and how this impacts me. That's what we're doing right now. When's the last time you picked up the, the jewel of salvation, examined it for all it's worth and to, and to see how it changes your heart and your mind and you're filled with adoration and love and humility because of the blood of the lamb that has washed you clean from all sins you will ever commit and have committed salvation by grace alone and faith alone through christ alone have you looked at this lately it is so so beautiful the once for all sacrifice a big deal it substantiates the shadow god's deal it fulfills his will now this number three it's christ's deal the once for all sacrifice is christ's deal it finished his work it finished his work look at verse 11 now and notice the author. I love his argumentation. I love the different ways he's helping us look at the old versus the new. Verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, Notice, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool uh, for his feet. The author is, is repeating truth now for a reason. Notice in these verses, notice in verse 11, the contrast between standing daily and then between Christ sitting down forever in verse 12. So if, if, if you're like me and you want to be a student of God's word, verse 11, you circle stands daily. Then you go down to verse 12, and you circle sat down. You draw a line between them. You say, here's the difference between the old and the new. Here's the difference between no rest and the rest that is found in Jesus Christ. You see the word but in verse 12, and you underline it and circle and say, huge, huge transition. Because the transition is being made there, what the old could not do, and what is accomplished within the new as well. So, so <coughs> excuse me, notice this, that the priest standing daily. Remember this, there wasn't even a chair in the holy places within the tabernacle. 
There wasn't a chair to sit on. Why? Because the work was never done. In the old covenant system, there was no true rest within it because the work was never completed. Hence, the priest stood daily as a reminder of the imperfection of what they were a part of. But, as verse 12 says, everyone say but. But, that's a huge transitional word. That's a beautiful, beautiful word there in the word but. When Christ offered himself, he sat down. The priest stands up. The great high priest in Jesus Christ, he sits down. Consider the imagery being said here. When Christ sits down, why? Because it is finished. Why? Because the, tur- because the curtain was torn. Why? Because payment had been made. Now right here, please allow me to pound the gospel into your heart. Right here in these verses. When Jesus died, sin was paid. When sin was paid, he sat down. Listen, listen. Because Jesus Christ rests forever, we as genuine believers in him, we also have rest in Jesus Christ, all because of Jesus Christ. Consider Hebrews 10 now. Consider the words of Matthew chapter 11. Jesus now says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. He continues, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls. He finishes, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Loved ones, Jesus isn't promising, Oh, you're tired and you're good night. I promise you a good night's sleep. No, no. He's not promising physical rest. He's promising here spiritual rest for the people who are agonizing over the burden of sin and guilt and cannot find the freedom they long for. He's promising that He will come, live and die, and be raised from the dead. That those who trust in Him and love Him and believe in Him will find rest eternally for their souls. When Jesus says it is finished, he sits down. He sits down at the right hand of God because sin has been paid in full. And because he sits down, listen, listen, because he rests. If you are genuinely saved in Jesus Christ, you've got to hear this today, man. God wants to set you free. Because he sits down, you and I, as followers of Christ, we also can rest and sit down only because of what he has done. So what does this message say right here? This is the gospel and power. This is the grace of God. When you understand that he sat down, it's done. Sin's paid, man, it's done. Past, present, future. The whole penalty of sin is on Christ. He took it, it's done, it's finished. It's finished. What happens to us? When you get this, you stop trying to earn favor with God. You stop trying to live in such a way that somehow when you do a thing, God's going, good boy, good boy, good girl, good girl. Now I'm more pleased with you. You can't be in a place of being God being more pleased with you. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more or less when you're truly saved in Jesus Christ. When you get this theology, you stop believing the lies of Satan that God's disappointed in you or God has disapproval over you. Listen, listen. God is never looking at one of his children going, you stink, and wow, I'm so disappointed. Oh, I can't believe it. I'm not talking to you anymore. God does not look upon you as an angry father who's waving his finger and saying, do better next time. Wow, you stink, and you're never going to approve. He doesn't ever, ever. Why? Why? Because all of our righteousness is found in Jesus Christ. 100%. The love of the Father has been perfected by the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus sat down. He sat down. And that's what guarantees our eternal rest by genuine faith in him. Stop trying to add to the cross. You can't add to perfection. Loved ones, be released from trying harder. I just gotta pray more. I just gotta do more stuff. I just gotta do this. I gotta serve the Lord. And in a sense, you're trying to do that because you think God's gonna look at you differently. Stop it. It's terrible theology. Be released from trying harder, but be released to love further. That's the impact of the true gospel. When the person understands that the blood of Jesus has washed them, that all their righteousness is found in Jesus Christ, that there's nothing they can do to be in a better standing with God. It's all been done in Christ. That person, like any person who genuinely receives the Lord and sees what it is, says, I cannot believe what he's been given, what I've been given in. I cannot believe he's done all of this for me. I cannot believe there's nothing I can do. And then it makes you so filled with love because you are captured by the fact you've been given life and now the rest of your life is lived in such a way you are pursuing the Lord in love not so he looks at you better 
because you can't help but respond to him with the love from the love that has set you free from sin and death and Satan. You see the difference there? You see the difference? You're not trying harder to earn, earn favor with God. You're loving more because that's the only proper response to someone who's been set free from death and sin itself. Loved ones, because, because Jesus rests, those washed in the blood of Jesus can also rest. The ones for all sacrifice, man, it's a big deal. It is God's deal. It's Christ's deal. And fourthly, now this, it's, it's this, it's, it's our deal. The ones for all sacrifice is our deal because it guarantees forgiveness. It guarantees forgiveness. Look at verse 14 now. For by a single offering... He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, verse 14, a single offering, the once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He has perfected. That doesn't mean believers in Christ don't sin anymore. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. We know we're not perfect, but it's positional sanctification, meaning we have been set apart from the guilty sense of sin, and we've been declared innocent. That means we're perfected. The, 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 the sentence of sin will never be held upon us. And because we've been perfected by the blood of Jesus Christ, we now are longing for the sanctification, the longing for heaven or glorification, the perfection that will come because of what Jesus Christ has done. Now look at verse uh, 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is Jeremiah 31, this is so great, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Verse 18, where there's forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering for sin. Here's the point of theology. This is so beautiful. When you've been washed by the blood, ready? You are cleansed forever. You are cleansed forever forever by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, now, let's be clear. We can grieve the Holy Spirit within our lives. We can quench the Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians, Ephesians as well. We can quench or grieve the Holy Spirit within our temple. But here's what we're learning right now. If we're truly saved in Jesus Christ, you can never see the Holy Spirit removed from your temple because ultimately it's God's temple. Hear this, hear this, hear this. If you're truly saved in Jesus Christ, you are absolutely secure in Jesus Christ. If you are genuinely born again, you cannot lose the gift of salvation that God has purchased through his son for you. The problem is, sometimes we forget the parables like the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is one example where Jesus explains to us that there will be people who seemingly respond to the gospel with joy. And they appear to demonstrate a temporary short-term fruit of joy and, and, and just enthusiasm for Jesus Christ, even to the point of, of starting to act like certain things. But the parable of the sower, Jesus explains, if you watch these seeds on this rocky soil or with weeds or whatever, if you watch them, Trials come in in life, and they're really tested. What do we believe? The temptations of the world come in, and all of a sudden, we find out where their heart's at, and Jesus explains when they're not legit, they will fall away. You see, so we think people, well, they're responding, they're indicating time is the greatest factor of genuine salvation. And what Jesus is helping us understand, the greatest test is time, but the whole point is this. If someone is truly saved, they will endure to the end. Now, we have good seasons and bad seasons. There are times where things are going really well and times where things. I watch people who have started great and drifted off and seemingly never returned. I have to, I have to assume then it wasn't legitimate fruit. I've also seen people, amazing start, tough, tough middle, but fantastic end. And God has proven that what happened in lives was legitimate as they continue in the end to follow the path and the love of Jesus Christ. But all this to say, once in Christ, you are absolutely perfectly secure in Christ, and that's why in Romans chapter 8, therefore, therefore there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are truly in Jesus Christ. You take this truth and you throw it in the face of Satan. When he comes and whispers these lies and all this stuff, you take the truth and you preach it, you sing it, you declare it, you write it, whatever you need to do, you hold that truth right up against evil, right up against darkness and say, I am a blood-bought child of God and I will never, ever, ever die because of what he has done. That's the truth that we say. We clap, we clap, we clap, we clap. Amen.
Once in Christ, secure in Christ. Unless I get too distracted by that, let's keep moving. Verse 15. And let me just say in verse 15, notice. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. Now notice this, okay? He's about to quote Jeremiah 31. And notice what the author wants us to see. I just can't go by this stuff. I want you to see it. Who wrote God's book? God wrote God's book. Who wrote Jeremiah 31? The Holy Spirit wrote Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah wrote it, but God ultimately wrote it. The Holy Spirit bears witness for us out of his way to say God wrote this book. And now what we see in verses 16 to 18, we see the power of the new covenant from Jeremiah or God's prophecy in Jeremiah 31. I want to end the message right now by showing you four attributes of the new covenant found in these verses right here. Four covenant or four attributes of the new covenant on the screen beside me. Notice this, number one, the new covenant ends the old. The new covenant ends the old covenant. In verse 16, it says, this is the covenant I will make with them. The new covenant replacing the old covenant. Okay, so when Christ appears... The old is ready to disappear as well. And now, this is why I love, I said this last week, but I want to say it again. This is the theology found within the temple or the tabernacle. Remember this? When Jesus Christ comes, the temple is no more. Why? The tabernacle started. It was changed into the temple. The temple was then destroyed by the Babylonians. Then the temple was rebuilt. And then the temple was enhanced by Herod and expanded. But Jesus Christ comes and he's like, I am the temple of God. And when he dies then, the temple is rendered obsolete. And that's why in AD 70, in the Romans and Titus, they come and they destroy the temple as Jesus prophesied it would happen. Because when the perfect sacrifice is made, it renders useless the blood of a goat or a calf. You see? So the new covenant then ends the old covenant. But amazingly, you need to know this, part of why Hebrews was written It was written to Jews that were desperately trying to hold on to the legalistic system of the old covenant. They didn't want to let it go. And the author of Hebrews keeps repeating himself saying, are you crazy? Let go of the old. You want temporary? You want want insufficient? You you you, You want a lack of permanent forgiveness? The new covenant, eternal, once for all, presence of God, fully forgiven. You want to hold on to the old? Are you crazy? The legalistic patterns be set free by the blood of the Lamb. What saddens me so much is in our day, there are areas of Christendom that are doing the same thing. You have these systems in the church of these legalistic, ritualistic-based forms of Christianity where it's all about rules and rituals and regulations and the ministers are heaping guilt upon the people. And if you don't do this, then God doesn't like you anymore. And if you don't attend here at this time, then you've lost favor with God. And if you go out and you say those kind of words, then all of a sudden God's going to look at you and he's going to reject you. And like, where are you getting that from? You're not getting it from the word, I'll tell you that much. That's not the gospel, loved ones. And these systems of Christendom that are built in these structures of legal spiritual abuse, it saddens me so much. But today we are standing here understanding what the Bible actually teaches. The grace of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, the longing to see what he would do in my life. So I'm not operating out of ritual, I'm operating out of relationship. And the fruitfulness that comes from a life operating in that will be way, way more ever than a guilt-produced legalistic system of some kind of dusty old religion. The new covenant ends the old. Secondly, the new covenant transforms the heart. So the old covenant dealt with external, temporary stuff, insufficient. But notice the prophecy of Jeremiah here in verse 16. Notice, I will put my laws on their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Do you see what genuine salvation does? It transforms the very heart of a person. Genuine salvation causes the mind of a person to become new. That is why with genuine salvation, there must be transformation because the theology demands it. Ready, ready? If you are truly justified in God's sight, declared innocent, if you are born again, if you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit from death to life, you can't stay there. It's impossible to truly be saved and not grow. On some level, if God makes you new, you must evidence the fact that you are new in Jesus Christ. 
So I've been saying this for 10 years in some form or another. So I'm okay with a bad day or a bad week or a bad month, even a bad year where things aren't just going. My affections aren't fired up for the Lord. I'm just not where I want to be. But where I get scared of or nervous is when someone says, well, I had a bad decade. Now, I'm not putting a timeline in this. I'm just saying, though, if you can go 10 years and not evidence a love for God or a transformation in your life or fruit of any kind or no hunger or not wanting to share your faith or just there's no substantial fruit for Jesus Christ of any kind like over a period of 10 years, I get nervous. I get nervous for you if you tell me that you're saved in Jesus Christ. I can't judge the heart, but we're supposed to look for the fruit. And there's no fruit in a decade. Are you sure you know Jesus Christ? Because if he has started something, he's going to complete it, Philippians 1, verse 6. And when he completes it, we're changed to look like Jesus Christ. The whole point of the new covenant is it changes us from the inside out. We literally go from death to life. And this is why we love glory stories so much in our church and wherever we hear them. Because it's someone who is walking along in death. They hear the gospel. Jesus transforms their heart by the blood and the new covenant of Jesus Christ. They literally go from death to life from being blind to seeing, and they just are completely transformed. They think differently, they live differently, they speak differently, they act differently, they love differently, and we marvel, and we're like, wow, look at that person. They were dead, but now they're alive. No one can do that but Jesus Christ through the washing of his blood. And literally, that's when I see people in our church all the time. People walk in, and honestly, you look at them, and you're like, they look dead. There's a, there's a, there's a gray glaze over their eyes. Their vocabulary has nothing in tune with what God wants. Their thinking patterns are filled with foolishness or just evil. But by God's grace, they, they remain here somehow and, and they hear the message of the gospel and they fall to their knees and they give their lives by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and they are transformed from death to life and you see them again and literally time after time after time after time, I will look at this individual and you just look different. You literally look different. There's a light in your eyes. There's a joy. In, they're not perfect, but there's a joy on their face. There's a love in their heart. There's an articulation with their voice. Why? Because they have been transformed from death to life. They have been set free from the penalty of sin with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They are literally a new creation. And the hugs and the high fives that come from those individuals as they rejoice and they literally leap and dance at times to say, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Because there's nothing that equates with being washed by the blood of Jesus Christ found in the once and for all sacrifice that is only in him. He has come to make new, loved ones. He has come to make new. The old covenant, the new covenant ends the old. The new covenant transforms the heart through the new covenant erases sin from the mind of God. This is awesome. Look at verse 17. Like, where are you getting this from? Here, notice. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Because of Christ and only because of the sacrifice of Christ, when I receive the gift of grace covering my sin, my sin, check it out, my sin, your sin is erased from the mind of God. This again is the power, this is the unbelievable understanding of the gospel. Since past, present, and future are erased from the mind of God, all because of Jesus Christ. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. So yes, we can grieve the Holy Spirit, as I said, but we can never be separated from the love of God again. We are washed in the blood. This is the power of the new covenant. And finally, the new covenant does this. The new covenant includes the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Look at verse 18. Where there is forgiveness of these, see the, the once and for all where sin is paid, when it has been done, when the blood of the Lamb of God has been shed, where there's forgiveness of sins, of these sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. Just imagine being a, a young adult who is, grew up in the Jewish system and you're hearing this or reading this for the first time. Your whole life, the whole fabric of your being was centered around the temple. And imagine, and the, and, the, and, the, and the system in the old covenant, and imagine you're reading this. Imagine you're like, what? What? Verse 18 no longer any offering for sin. Imagine wrestling with that, but that is the truth. This is the glory found in the once for all sacrifice in Jesus Christ. It includes the sacrifice that would end all sacrifices. Loved ones, once for all. It fills in the shadow. 
It fulfills God's will. It finishes Christ's work. And I'm praying right now it fires, up, fires us up with, with love. Now, you might go through these 18 verses and say, well, well, now what do I do? Well, that's verse 19. And if you want verse 19, you've got to come back next week. All right? <laughs> but let me give you one word. One word in verse 19, the word therefore. Therefore is the hinge which takes all the doctrine of Hebrews and now starts to unpack it into the practical understanding of who should I be, how should I operate in the church, what should Christ be doing in my life if I understand I've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is next week, Lord willing, and the weeks to follow. Can't wait. The beautiful doctrine of the blood of Christ expanding now next week into the practical outworking of what that looks like within our hearts and lives. Let's pray together, loved ones. Let's pray. Father, right now I ask that we are in awe. I pray you would work by your spirit to cause us to be in awe of the blood of the lamb. That child that Simeon held and his blood filled his veins. The blood, Lord, that would be spilled for the redemption and the salvation for the sins of this world, for all who believe by grace through faith. And maybe you're here right now and you have not yet given your life to Jesus Christ. You can call out to him. You can cry out to him even now. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Jesus Christ, I believe you died as the sacrifice for my sins. Jesus Christ, your blood is what sets me free. Jesus Christ, I confess that you are Lord of my life and my Savior. Jesus Christ, I want new life. I want my eyes to go from being glazed over in darkness to be filled with the light of the Lord of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, I want to be forgiven. Oh, set me free. Lamb of God, set me free. I embrace, I receive the gift I cannot earn, the gift I cannot deserve. I receive it as a gift of grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ by believing through faith in him. And loved ones, right now as we respond to this message, just maybe your heads bowed again just in a time of quiet, just before this message was preached, we sang that song, There is a Fountain. And we're going to sing it again. And I want you to look now with new eyes and with hearts full and to let this beautiful hymn speak over your life. Maybe sit there so quietly and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blood. It says, there is a fountain filled with blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins. And all those who are drenched in this flood, the flood of the blood, will lose all their guilty stains. Think about that, loved ones. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, if you are saved in him, there is no guilt. It's gone. It's all gone. All these have been washed away. There's no guilty stains. All because of the love, of the power, of the blood of Jesus Christ.